So we're having our third webinar of uh, Indigenous peoples from around the world talking up about complexity. Um, we've got Beth Smith, we've got uh, Melanie Goodchild this time, and we have uh, Dave Snowden, as always, and his, he's wearing a sweater tonight. It is, it's a it? cardigan, Tyson. Cardigan. cardigan, sorry, Card cardigan. Are you from Cardigan? No, no, it's it's this is art. This is Irish. All this they named half of half of Britain after just things that were lying around the house: sandwich, cardigan, all these things. Now, uh, yeah, so so in we jump, um, pretty much straight in, and we've got a lot to get through today. Um, so I think we're going to uh, start out with a cup of tea. Um, now, uh, Melanie Goodchild, who's joining us today, she's from the Turtle Island Institute. Uh, she actually, she's actually just about to move um, back to her homeland. Um, I think she can tell us all about that. Um, yeah, so she, her notes uh, have been lost in the move, her notes for today. So she's going to be riffing off the top of her head. And she might talk a bit about tea because she's actually a tea sommelier and, um, or is at least married to one. And uh, most of the cups of tea that I've had this year have been with with Mulaney. Um, yeah, over sort of Zooms uh, between here and Turtle Island. Um, yeah, so it's it's interesting how like there's that idea that the British Empire was built on tea. You know that the I keep hearing this phrase, and um, you know they all it's all it's something you think of as essentially British. But then somehow indigenous people everywhere always seem to pick up uh, tea is where we end up. So we even have a, um, it's such a really essential part of indigenous life in Australia, a cup of tea that, um, that we even have a research methodology that's called the cup of tea research methodology. I'm not kidding. My, um, my partner uses it and she actually has specially made cups for it with cup of tea uh, written on that she uses for that. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very particular data collection uh, method and analysis <laughs> method, <laughs> weirdly enough. I wondered if everybody would like to introduce themselves by um, uh, saying who they are and then and what their cultural connection to tea is. Would that be weird? No, that's a good idea. Let's do it. Go for it, Beth. Yeah, uh, hello, I'm Beth um, from Wales, but currently living in Denmark, so left my roots behind a little bit there. Um, so my cultural connection to tea, um, Glen Getty, milk, one sugar, um, no, no, nothing too kind of dramatic for me. I, I'm, I'm not a huge tea drinker, so I'll let somebody more exciting uh, tell us their details. Tyson, after that good plug, you've got to have something good to say. Oh man, I was I was hoping that would be in the lull. No, I already did. I said it's a research methodology. <laughs> <laughs> nah, finish. Um, uh, Dave, I guess first. Yeah. Okay. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, when I was growing up, I mean, tea was part of the family. It was kind of like there was always a teapot on the hearth by the fire. Mm. And people would just keep putting more tea and more water in it throughout the day. So by the end of the day, you could literally stand a teaspoon up in it. And in Lancashire, that's called a Grayley cup of tea, right? Um, and since then, I mean, I worked in Singapore for a long time, so I got into tea ceremonies. So now I've got white tea and green tea and rooibos tea and four different types of oolong tea and a, a tea maker which does it all for me and calculates the temperature. So I've become a tea obsessive, but that's another matter. Yeah. Mm. And um, yeah, so I think, I mean, it came from India and China. I think it came from China first to the UK, not and then from India, if I remember the sequence. Yeah. Mm. And there's some lovely stories about tea. I mean, I got one which is called Dragon something or other, because an emperor sort of sit, you know, hid it in his pocket and it got flattened on the way home and things like that. So there's all sorts of fascinating stories about it. Nice. But yeah, it's an English dish, all right? We're, the Welsh inherited it. 
And just be careful when you use British and when you use English Tyson, because it has major significance where we It does, from. doesn't it? Yeah. So we're, yeah. We're the first and last, we were the first and probably will be the last colony. Right? Yeah. A A Anglos do, do like to airbrush, uh, airbrush with, with that, word, that term British, don't they? But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll get to that as well. And pardon me, sir. Um, no, um, Mulaney. <laughs> that's your that's your runway of, of familiarity to bring you in and, and oh, thank um, you. yeah welcome you here and and of course we we all acknowledge um you know the lands where we are and you're quite familiar with my place um uh, here both where I'm from which we've gone into very deep with uh, our stories together that we've shared and um yeah but this particular screen is is facing you know a wall on uh, Bunurong country in Nam in Melbourne um, and respects you know um, from my elders and to your elders and your old people um, going back you know through all time uh, back and forth uh, it's good to see you again sis. Great it's good to see you and really nice to meet everyone so I'm going to introduce myself according to our Anishinaabe protocols and so Anishinaabe Anishinaabe Kwayanda, I'm Anishinaabe, which in English here in um, Turtle Island in the English language is also known as Ojibwe or Chippewa or Salto. So, Bojo and Dinamamaganaduk, Apichago, Magwich, Bizindawiyag, Mino Gijep, which is early morning for, for some of you um, in Australia. So, good morning. I said greetings to you, all of my relatives. Apichago, Magwich, Bizindawiyag, thank you for listening. Nishnabe Kweyanda, Moose and Dondam, I'm Moose Clan, Biktagong, Nishnabe, Donjaba, Kiragon, Zibi, and Donjaba. Those are the two First Nations I'm from in Northern Ontario. Wabshke, I'll get you Kwe, Zanang, Indigenous, Waba, Naga Kwe, Indigenous. Those are my two spirit names, how I'm known in the spirit world. And I'm here at my home, my home right now. As Tyson mentioned, we are kind of excited. We're in the process of moving. Uh, about eight hours north of here into northern Ontario to Bawating, the place of the rapids. We're uh, kind of right in between where both my mom and uh, my dad's First Nations are. But today I'm here in Crystal Beach, which is right near Niagara Falls, Ontario. So this is traditional Haudenosaunee Confederacy territory and Three Fires Confederacy territory. And the three fires here are the Potawatomi, the Odawa and the Anishinaabe. And my, my relationship to tea, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Tyson tea, cup of tea as a methodology, because I'm really exploring relational methodologies like yarning. I've been able to yarn with, with our relatives in Australia and start to understand what the protocols are. And so one of the things that we, we've done as well is um, my partner Sly, who's Algonquin in French, he has become a, a tea specialist, a certified tea specialist. And He's spent time in both Japanese and Chinese tea ceremonies. And so we practice something called Gong Fu Cha. And my uncle Dan Longboat, who's Haudenosaunee, he talks about cultural fluency. And it's been an interesting experience for us because we live in a time of prophecy. And in this time, the seventh fire, it was said that there would be the new people. The new people are the Ashkemadizig. And these new people would uh, you could say decolonize, that's how we might say it contemporary, but really reconnect to Mother Earth, to each other, and it would be people from all four directions. And so it's interesting that the, the medicine, we say mushkiki, mushkiki really translates as the strength of Mother Earth, uh, mushk, he or she is strong, a key is land or Mother Earth. And so mushkiki means the strength from Mother Earth. And Camellia sinensis, which is the, the, the herb, the tea, um, it's the plant that comes from, discovered actually by the indigenous peoples of, of China um, a long time ago and, and made its way around the world. So it did come to us you know, on ships and it was very expensive back in the day. But we have a really deep tea culture here as well. It, it's not Camellia sinensis, though it's other types of natural plants. And so we have something called Labrador tea, which is we call swamp tea. We have cedar tea, which is a medicinal tea that we drink um, for purification. It's one of our four sacred medicines. And so, <clears throat> but I grew up with my grandma putting, um, you know, bags of tea on the fire and just keeping it going. And it never got too strong. It was kind of like a magical teapot. 
you could just go in there and pour yourself a cup of tea. And so we, we do have a deep tea culture um, out west. Other nations like the Blackfoot Nation pick mint, and so they have mint tea. And so we do have that association here of tea and a yarn, of, of sitting down, um, sharing, sharing knowledge, sharing teachings, uh, always having a, a cup of tea. And I remember the last time I visited one of the elders up north, and he had his his uh, saucepan on the stove and he had a couple of bags of tea and he just poured it into cups for us. And that's that's really how I grew up is, you know, having cups of tea. Doesn't mean I don't drink coffee, but um, but the methodology of, of relationality and what I think the tea <laughs> service does or tea sessions. So we've had many bowls of tea together. Um, my family and Tyson's family I think what it does is it uh, it allows us to shift our consciousness, but it also picks up on our our tradition of feasting. And so when we feast and we eat and we drink together, we ingest the spirit of what's being said. And so now when I have conversations on Zoom, I encourage people and ask people to make themselves a cup of tea so that they can slurp and, and drink along with us. So mm -hmm. that uh, that was a nice runway. Thanks, Tyson. Melanie, I, I don't know if you noticed, I, you wouldn't have noticed because you're talking like I can never read the comments at the same time. Mm -hmm. But all the comments is kind of there's this emergent protocol happening where everybody's um, saying who they are and, you know, uh, what lands they're on and what kind of tea they're drinking. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's this, this, I, I can't quite describe it, but there's something lovely about it. Um, yeah, it's very, very groovy. So, um, yeah, did you want, did you want to, um, jump into a, a general, I don't know, a, a general kind of impression of, of, um, of what you recall from, cause you've had to view all the previous two webinars and, um, you know, just sort of, uh, Give us a quick sense of your um, your overall feeling about that, and maybe riff on that, and then um, you know let us know where you'd like to go today um, with everything and what's uh, what's coming um, from you, um, your feeling for today. I think uh, you know from what I remember because this is actually memory as opposed to the notes that I had. Um, I remember when you, when you were first uh, together speaking about identity and and some of the similarities and differences in the Welsh experience and the experience you know with um, with you Tyson and and in, in Australia and I remember feeling myself actually uh, more aware and sensitive of the binaries that we create when we talk about things like that which is that um, the the white people you know and the black people and the yellow people and the red people and that's part of our medicine wheel teaching and it did refer to the four great nations and i i, I tend to think of um have mental models in for myself of of who was colonized and who they were colonized by and in that first yarn i remember hearing dave and beth talking about their stories their identity the the language and how powerful language is and i've had that teaching uh, I don't speak my language fluently, Anishinaabemowin. And so uh, my dad went to Indian residential school. My mom went to Indian day school. And so they were part of the last generation that, you know, may have had the opportunity to be educated um, at home before they went to residential school in their language. Whereas when I was born, they knew that, you know, send me to school and I learned English. And so I've been picking up our language um, as I can from ceremony and with elders. And it's just so important because it really does encode um, or codify your values, your beliefs, you know, how you say things, the words that you have. And I've been fascinated by language and identity in terms of the words that don't exist in English. There's, there's, a, there's a pattern there, you know, I'm a, a systems and complexity scholar, uh, um, like all of you, and, and I hear from you know, folks in Japanese, they'll have a word for a certain type of energy or a certain type of time. And so these, these really big concepts of time and space are so different when you have words for it or you have a different way of explaining something. And so in Nishnabemowin, and a lot of indigenous languages are like that, you know, we don't have, uh, it's not very noun based. 
it's verb based and so there's a lot of animacy so when you're you know in relationship with the world the natural world for example uh, you are not thinking of a tree as a noun as a thing as an it so that relationality is really important i mean even in the teachings of of tea you know we drink um something called puar and it is a fermented tea and it's old and sometimes uh it comes from old growth teas and we've done an experiment um with colleagues of ours friends of ours that are, are tea enthusiasts as well who who are um chinese and we'll drink the same cup of puar so we'll drink the very same tea or we'll send that to to them and then internal gong fu cha is connecting to the chi of the tea and that for us is is resonant with our culture it's about you know connecting with the spirit and so we have the menadug the spirits and the spirits are a really huge part of our identity and our language but the disenchantment of the world i've found that is another pattern you know that that people are um almost ashamed i think it's sometimes to say what they believe in because we're told that's not rational and in our culture it's kind of irrational to not understand that you have invisible helpers let's call them invisible helpers that's what her navigant and an elder from back home used to call them and so the the teaching of the tea for example that old growth tea we did uh we've done this experiment in this um where we drink the same tea and then we close our eyes and we really you know tap into the chi and then we write down the images and the feelings the tastes that come to mind and then we compare notes and it's you know time after time those notes are very similar if you really connect to the tea and the medicine the mushkiki of the tea and so when i was listening to the to the yarns i was you know fascinated by how complexity from a you know maybe from a conventional western mindset you know that's what we study but then also our anishinaabe or indigenous complexity mindsets how those can help us navigate these spaces and you know i'll talk maybe a little bit more about this later but the space between is really fascinating for me so in those yarns there was this space between each of you that was fascinating like what were you saying what were you not saying and how did language influence that so that that's all what what resonated with me and I was looking forward to to being able to yarn because as I watched the first couple I wanted to jump in there with some of the things I had in mind so um yeah maybe I'll turn it over to to you to if there's any reflections you raised something mm. very interesting there which is the, the the question I mean it's it's a spiritual question it's this question of connectivity with things right and I think yeah, and I remember when I first went through a drum ceremony up in Saskatoon, um, which was fascinating, right? Um, and I grew up in a Catholic tradition anyway. So that concept of ritual and ceremony and connectedness was a part of that, all right? Um, but religion almost in the modern world has become absconded into two particular pernicious things. One is everybody now thinks Christianity is a form of extreme right-wing Southern United States, Bible-believing, quite something quite perverted. You know, so if you, if you don't believe in that, you, you're meant to be an atheist. Or you've got the sort of faux Buddhism of, of Westerners adopting Eastern religion without really understanding it because they like the concept of being a guru. So I think one of the things I'm concerned about, and we're looking at this in terms of the idea of the numinous, is you need to make spirituality or religion authentic. It doesn't necessarily have to be believing God, but it has to be a belief in this is the numinous idea something that is more or other than you that you have to have a relationship with and it's almost like we've lost the ability for people to actually work in that way it's is religion has stopped becoming a naturalistic part of the way we live our lives it's become something which is an ideological belief system you have to assume or reject which is never what it was historically for me there's, there's something there about particularly reflecting on a, a Welsh pagan tradition um, and the shift from having multiple gods um, to that that kind of one god that idea of um, kind of uh, if you've read any of the, the philosophy god is a lobster the the twist the double bind like the the, the single bifurcation at the top of a pyramid and we just kind of all fall to, into some kind of fractal arrangement underneath that. 
um, and it's all kind of shoehorned into this single entity. Um, and, and that as a belief system, you know, when it starts to come out in, in religion, it becomes very easy to start applying it to governance, to social order that, you know, we all, all default to this pyramid system um, with the single, usually male entity at the top. Um, and, and I'm particularly interested to hear, you know, from, from other perspectives where you have this idea of multiple gods, different totems that represent <laughs> different aspects of God in, in whatever God might be in its, its plural sense. Well, it's, it's there to make um, um, the enforcement of contracts impossible, I reckon. Uh, the kind of spiritual plurality we have all as entities in the landscape <laughs> around you, I think. Or more specifically, monotheism, I think, was invented to, um, you know, enforce contracts, it's like a smart contract kind of thing. You know, like originally, like in the, the earliest civilizations in the Fertile Crescent and everything, those first laws and everything, um, you know, uh, contracts uh, always had built into them. You had to swear an oath on this god that they kind of just invented um, or they'd elevated one of the local deities or whatever. Um, you know, this big universal one god who would definitely kill you if you didn't. Uh, meet the <laughs> requirements of your contract. So I, I think it's purely because of that, that, um, and that was about, and that's about seeking to control the future, you know, so there's, and it's all part of the same thing, you know, what, what civilization does, particularly what empire mm -hmm. does, as it seizes control of the narrative of the past, to make sure that everybody knows how terrible the past was. And that, um, you know, things are getting better. So no matter how miserable you are now, I tell you, you're lucky, though, because things were heaps worse. Oh, I tell you, you Welsh, you're lucky we came. You're lucky we came because you were just groveling around in your own shape before. And I, I don't know why that it's an Irish one saying. And they keep telling us that. Anyway. I mean, but it's interesting. If we go back to the laws of Haldar in the 8th century, women were allowed to divorce their husbands for cruelty and take half their land. And the English said that was us being uncivilized. So, yeah, so we have to get rid of it, right? But I think, I think there's another interesting thing here. There's a, there's a famous, the, the Celtic Christianity was very different from Roman Christianity. It was based on abbots and chiefs. So it was monasteries and local chiefs in a multi-distributed environment. And the community of saints was actually multiple gods. I mean, you know, the whole Catholic Church just absorbed native religions and multiple gods and called them saints instead. And then what happened with the Synod of Whitby, everything got concentrated into the king and the pope. So everything got centralized from that point onwards. And that was when the Celtic Church was destroyed. I mean, it was actually quite close to the Orthodox. So I think there, there are traditions all over the world which are much more collectivist, much more integrative, much more localized which we can fall back on, yeah? And much more interesting, it's, it's like the high, I spent a lot of time with the Hyder folk, right? And some of the, the you know, the symbiote symbols of, of the Hyder are just wonderful, right? In terms of the way they encapsulate meaning in simple form. And that that's something we've lost, is that ability to see things in semiotics and symbols, yeah? Absolutely. Um, I don't know if, um, if you guys have come across that book uh, yet that's come out recently, um, you know, uh, Graeber, um, before he passed away, he, he, he co-wrote yeah. that one, The, the dawn, dawn of Everything. Yeah, anyway, somebody's um, drawn my attention to the second chapter of that. You might all want to uh, have a look at it at some stage. It sounds like it's a, it's a great book that will sort of reinforce everything that you already think. And, it, I, I enjoyed that reading the small part that I did. I just went, oh, yes, me, 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 me. That's but anyway, I try not I to read things that reinforce my opinions too much. I mean, if it had been a third of the length, it would be a lot easier. But I think the key thing is in chapter two, where mm. he talks about authority structures changing between summer and winter. Mm. And I think that's fascinating. There's the evidence that people could move into distributed or centralized models based on the season. So there wasn't a single model, and that's where the monuments come from. So I, I mean, I think it's one of those books everybody needs to read and think about because it mm. changes the way you see history. Mm. Yeah, well, you especially need that in cold places. If you're going to move everybody inside for half the year, then you know, you're going to need someone someone else in charge. 
Yeah, there's a yeah, really some... interesting ethnographies of Inuit people in that as well, mm. which he talks about, right? And the, the ability to, to accept conflict at certain times of the year in certain contexts, but not at other times. Mm. Well, and I, I think it's it's that philosophy of diversity, which is what complexity is about as well, is, is different contexts, different approaches. I think that's where I'd like us to finish up today, um, of what, what we, we actually have to offer as Indigenous peoples um, to the world in terms of... Um, in terms of solutions for you know the design of, of these uh, sort of systems that are needed, you know, in a time when all the none of the institutions are working particularly well and all the systems are failing, um, you know, that we perhaps have some governance models um, that that are worth having a look at, and we have some you know certain aspects of, you know, for example, what uh, Lainey was mentioning before that you know the the verb based uh, languages etc. Um, but there's there's one thing. I think a lot of our scholarship and a lot of our commentary, and I know that a lot of the events and interviews and things that I have to do, uh, people are directing you towards a particular kind of speech and a particular, um, I don't know, standpoint um, that is quite, it's weak tea, if you know what I mean. It's um, it's about the fact of having an indigenous person there, and that we are centering an indigenous voice. And can you get up for a minute, please, and talk about how important it is that we're centering your voice? Um, do you know what I mean? Like that's it. Everything's um about the representation. It's like um, yeah. So you're there we, to speak we, we about. In Wales, you're there to speak about how important it is that you're there speaking about that. That's what you. That's it, your topic. It's worse. We get it. You're Welsh, would you please sing us a song? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a tone-deaf Welshman, this is a constant embarrassment, but the assumption is, you know, that, that that's our stereotype role, so we're expected to perform. I think I, I, think I did that the first time I met you, didn't I? You did. I, I, I forgive you. <laughs> so, but, um, I mean, I think that, yeah, it, it, well, it, it's kind of fascinating. One of the things you said last week, which I've, I've talked about a lot over the previous week, over the, over the week since, is that you were taught the Union Jack represented all four nations of the UK. Ah. But it specifically doesn't include the Welsh. Yeah. That's um, what they, that's that, what that they teach us here, though. There's it like a children's know, that, game with a rhyme and everything that goes with it. England, but Ireland, one thing I've always got Wales. embarrassed by in Australia, and, and lesser extent New Zealand, Maori are, I think, a little bit different, partly because they fought the British Empire to a standstill. And OK, the British Empire cheated on the peace treaty, but they, they had to accept they, they'd met a superior force. But it's just the, the tokenism of you're expected to perform. Mm. It, it's, it's, it's like, you know, there's a Welsh national costume, which we're all meant to wear, but it was invented by the Victorian English because they wanted us to be a tourist trap. Mm. And, yeah, I've, I've seen that. You go up to Ayers Rock or places like, you know, Ayers Rock, or you go up to the, the Blue Mountains, mm. and you've got these token performances going on in which you're being put into a little box mm. because you belong to something quaint, which we tolerate. I, I think that's the feeling of it. Mm. We tolerate you because you're a tourist attraction, you're entertaining, you have beautiful land, you say different things, which we don't have to deal with. We can listen to you, we can be entertained, then we go back to our ordinary day-to-day -day lives afterwards. Mm. London, yeah. see, I mean, one, one of the films which we all grew up on was, um, oh God, what was it? It was um, Walkabout. Oh my God. Which was, uh, yeah. yeah, which had all sorts of problems in it, all right? I mean, it was, mm. it was a film of its time. Mm. But the moment when she sat in that flat at the end, I think that that's actually that that's Jenny Agutter at her best, mm. because it basically shows that where she is is has no authenticity to anything. She's been displaced as an object. So yeah, aside yeah. from the other problems in that film as it goes through, yeah, I think that that's actually quite a significant. Well, that wasn't moment. the very end. The very end was the like the closing credits, which is like fifteen minutes of Jenny Agutter naked. Because it's Jenny Agata and she always has to take yeah, her clothes yeah. off in every single movie, no matter what it's about. So um, in, in Railway Children, Tyson, it was only in only in that one. Right? Yeah, yeah, Just, unbelievable. Hey, um, mm. well, I, I just, uh, just I've got to get back to that b before I throw it back to uh, Mulaney again. I just got to get back to that. Um, oh, the Maori fought fought the British to a standstill kind of thing. Look, you know that that's nothing to be proud of. 
It's just that they remembered a few structures from centuries before when they were, you know, experimenting with imperialism. And so they were like, oh, how did we, uh, how did we do that standing army, bro? How, what, what, are, what are the techniques for forcing everybody into a big, massive standing army? Oh, that's right, we did it like, and, they, and then they did it like that. You know, I don't think that's anything particularly to be proud of. If you have, if you have such, an, a, a, um, such an amazing governance and social structure uh, that it prevents people from forming into massive groups that are able to, to conscript people into a st permanent standing army in order to face off a, an equally psychotic foe, I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. I'm certainly not ashamed of um, the fact that we haven't won this war yet. We're just using different tactics. We're actually breeding, we're breeding the invaders out like very gradually. We've got about another 50 years, just the current sort of, uh, you know, birth rates and death rates and, and everything else. We've got about another 50 years before everybody in Australia is Aboriginal again. So, you know, they may have won a few, they've won a few battles, the British, but, but we're going to win the war. We're going to love them to it's death. It's a unique feature. It's not necessarily special, but it is unique, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think it, it's, it, it's allowed some of the issues like some of the Maori concepts of justice and the like, yeah. To actually have a bigger influence than the other boys <clears> would, right? So, I mean, the Maori Pakaha thing in New Zealand is very different from Whitey Aboriginal in Australia or the whole First Nation issue within in Canada. Yeah. So I think there are differences on that. And I think the issue yeah, is true. what can we learn from them? Well, I might ask Mulaney about that. What's, the, what's that... Um... Iron fist in a velvet glove like there in Canada, because you know Canada's always everybody's impression of Canada is that it's that it's so awesome and left and PC that everybody's really gentle and loving and awesome, um, you know, and, and they're always doing sort of land acknowledgments and stuff like this. So um, so things there must be great, right? Uh, I think um, you know when you talked about narrative and who controls the narrative and how empire building. <clears throat> erases the history that we don't want to we don't want to hear about so we had something called a truth and reconciliation commission here yeah. in Canada and that brought out you know the stories that uh, that the survivors had kept inside for so many years but really when you ask um, you know I do workshops and speak all over I I used to feel guilty about saying no at speaking events until a mentor of mine said well from a systems lens they think they're doing something by getting you to speak but, and so you're letting them off the hook instead of them doing something more, like shifting their governance and their business model and things like that. So now, now I, I feel a little bit better when I, um, I, I pick and choose, you know, uh, where I'm going to talk. And so in Canada, you know, the, the empire building that history includes something called the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius. And a, and a lot of Canadians in our education system, they don't know what that is. I mean, I wasn't taught that in, in education uh, in mainstream education and the history of this country, you know, the history of this country starts at contact. It starts with the formation of the nation state. It ignores thousands of years of history here, mm. migration stories, you know, all of, we have an oral history, but we also have pictographs and sacred scrolls and songs. And there's like that history is so rich and diverse across Turtle Island. And so the, the doctrine of discovery and Terra Nullius was that if if you found a land and it was a, a papal bull, papal decrees, which have been challenged in, in the courts, both in Canada and the US, uh, but it was the justification for the genocide that happened here. It was that if you are not Christian, you are not human. And therefore, when we were discovered, my ancestors um, and others here, we were not humans because we were not Christian. And so the foundation of Canada and the United States is the dehumanization of indigenous peoples, and certainly the slaughter of our relatives, like like the buffalo, and the beaver, you know, for fur and, and fur trade. So you you don't really learn a lot of that history. And I'm just thinking about narratives. And the, the oddest thing that came to me was uh, in a previous life I worked in film and television, and I worked on a movie called Grey Owl, and it was it was directed by Lord Richard Attenborough, who's passed. Um, to those of us uh, on set, he was Dickie, and uh, his brother makes these, you know, documentaries about uh, about the world, uh, the climate crisis. Um, David Attenborough, but this, but I remember this because uh, Richard Attenborough did these sort of sweeping biopic pictures, right, like uh, Chaplin and Gandhi and 
and and he won Oscars. He won Oscars for these different these different works. And so I saw the script for Grey Owl, and I was uh, just a young struggling filmmaker. I had written a couple of screenplays, which are still on my shelf that I'm supposed to rewrite. But uh, I arrived on set, and I was in the AD department. But I, you know, so so I wasn't in a, in the in the hierarchy, I was not in a place to question the script, believe me. So the actors arrived and it was Pierce Brosnan, who was famous for uh, being James Bond um, and others. And there were indigenous actors. And it really told the Grail narrative from the perspective of of him. And if, if you haven't heard of him sort of around the world, Grail was in his time, he was like the Beatles. That's how Richard Attenborough talked about him. He was the most famous Red Indian in the world, but he was actually Archie Bellany, um, uh, a British um, uh, kind of imposter, I guess you might say. I mean, he shaved his chest and his body hair and he dyed his skin dark and he had long hair, but he was a conservationist. And in fact, he, he, he who he kind of spoke about were, were our relatives and Nick, which are the beavers. Um, and so when I was on that film, it was also, uh, he was kind of showing his indigenous female um, counterpart in the film, her culture. Uh, that, that's the line they just, instead of actually all of the people who taught him what he learned. And I think it's so powerful and, and that those different entry points into shifting the narrative can be so powerful because we can all remember films, you know, that, that taught us things. And, made us think about things. Um, I did a webinar earlier this week with uh, Andre Magison, who wrote, who's from Iceland, Reykjavik, and, and he wrote a book called On Time and Water. And he talked about Blade Runner and how Blade Runner took place in 2019. Remember with the, the fake animals and, and the, the hovercraft and people living off world. And, and so I just, I'm thinking about narrative. That's what I wanted to kind of yarn about was if if people don't know these histories uh, and and are uncomfortable with it, and I think a complexity mindset helps you be able to cope with the fact that your ancestors could have been on a slave ship or could have been slave owners in in um, in America. And I heard a lady earlier this week say that there are scuba divers, um, they are um, black scuba divers that are looking for all of the voyages of slave ships and how many thousands, I think it was like tens of thousands of slave ships that brought the enslaved black people to Turtle Island and how many of those went down and have never been found. And nobody knows that story. Um, so I'm thinking that that's a really important aspect of, of our complexity work is mm. how to interpret those stories and, and share them with people. Mm. Well, and, and to ensure there's, sorry, go, go back. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a, something about the weight that we give to stories um, and, and, and almost a, a gradient at which they, they're accepted. Um, so the more you're exposed to the story, the more likely you are to, to accept it. Um, and so that, that's where it, it kind of connects back to that thing that you said about me, about having the, the, token, the token Indigenous person, you know, at a conference, that as much as it might feel, you know, a bit crappy and tokenistic, that, you know, at the same time, it's, it's almost a double bind in that, you know, you're, you're, you're giving platform to your voice and, you know, you, you, you're so much more than that. Um, but that, that case of, you know, you, you've got to see it to be it. Um, that at that point, you're a, an ambassador and an inspirer. Um, but as to, to how much weight and credibility an audience gives you um, when you're coming from a different set of, of ways of knowing or, or, or kind of, yeah, kind of epistemic resources in that sense. And, and I think that for me, I'd be really keen to dig in deeper amongst us about this idea of the invisible helpers or, or from, from Tyson's culture at the moment, I'm a bit more sleep talk than I am sand talk. Um, so how um, kind of dream time and, and some of the, the less rational um, knowledge sources and how they play out and, and the credibility and the, the value of the knowledge that they're actually given. So I, I don't know if you've yeah. got like I, I'd love to hear more about that from from your cultures. 
Well, yes, only if you tell me about your goblins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, same one. Uh, well, we just got the same little people stories as, as everybody in the world. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very strange. There must have been something kind of small. You know, there must have been a Homo Florensis kind of everywhere at some stage. Because, uh, yeah, we basically just have those same stories <laughs> that everybody has. And sometimes they're, uh, they're good people, but they're always uh, tricky and clever people. And, um, and you got to watch out for them. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I think, I think we, so there's, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a, a double story happening here because um, I, I know, Beth, you, you'd like for us to delve into the spirituality side of things. And, but we also wanted to have a look at, um, at uh, decolonization and um and the kind of branding of decolonization 2.0 that's kind of going on in the world right now and 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 where that's taking us um i'd like us to try and weave those two things together um in the in the last half year uh, in the same way that we wove tea into our um opening acknowledgements so as much as possible let's reference spirit and um and then let's kind of I don't know, let's uh, weave a bit of a narrative that's sort of tying together the past and the present and, and potentially the future um, with uh, what de decolonization was, what it is, what it will be, uh, but we'll try and fuse that together. So I do have a bit of a provocation um, I can read out to you um, for that one, which should get us all debating pretty um, pretty pretty viciously i imagine it'll take me about two minutes to read it before i do dave is, is there anything else you needed to throw into the pot um so the the spoon will stand up in it um i think there's i mean it's interesting there isn't that the little people aren't part of welsh legends they're part of irish and scottish but they're right. not in welsh legends yeah mm. um so that 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 is an interesting difference right mm. And I think the, the, the narrative thing is, is when you're brought up in Britain, you're brought up with this, it's almost like an excuse. We had an empire, but it was better for people to be under the English empire than the French or the Spanish. And, and that, that's still a dominant story. And it's, mm. a, it, it's a story which doesn't challenge the whole concept of empire. It says empire was inevitable and you were just lucky to be under the English one. Yeah, uh, and I, I think that there's a problem on that because people don't challenge those sort of stories. They're so dominant in the sort of underlying substrate, yeah, of sort of films and and books and everything else that are difficult to escape from. Yeah, we we cop that as well. Oh, you're lucky it wasn't the Dutch. You're just lucky, anyway. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to read you this bit. This is um a draft um from the um. Sand talk sequel that I'm, I'm trying to write right now. Um, it'll take about two minutes, but it's something that's really been troubling me. And um, anyway, like I said, it's a draft. It probably won't even make it into the final thing. Uh, but it's something that's been troubling me a lot, and I'm just trying to get my head around it. I think we can weave some story around this. <clears throat> get those tricky little people running around the edges. All right, so here we go. Um, the last time Indigenous people worldwide were conscripted to decolonize the globe, it was post-World War, and the new leaders of the world needed our help in divesting Europe of its empires, uh, although Britain somehow kept Australia as a consolation prize. The goal was to facilitate the scaling of a global imperial conglomerate under North America. This process of liberation seldom went well for the decolonizers who usually found themselves shot or exiled after the heavy lifting was done, replaced with extremist despots and corporate puppets installed by the new sheriff in town. I'm kind of glad Australian Indigenous people weren't invited to the party at that time. But we are the bell of the ball in this latest revolutionary reboot, which is nothing like decolonization classic at all. This Fabulous new zeitgeist is bespoke, individualized, factional, and corporatized. We're decolonizing through radical inclusion in the machine by demanding representation in the colony itself, becoming the colony while we renovate our lives in a post-colonial style. It's an aesthetic we apply to our minds, our disciplines, our organizations, and media, extracted from a few tragic but trivialized data points 
in our exotic demographic profiles and histories, we're encouraged to lend our native eye to redecoration efforts everywhere, as long as it's in front of the curtain. Nothing structural is allowed. <clears throat> we platform and amplify thinkers who are culturally anti-colonial, but fiscally colonial. Um, we can have more indigenous leaders in real estate, commerce and politics, but just as long as we focus on representation and never notice the machinery of property, finance and governance. Uh, with old school decolonization, at least the cui bono was clear and we could all see who the new masters would be. I'm not sure who the new engineers of this revolution are, unless China and Russia are really half as clever as many liberal pundits claim them to be. I suspect it's a lot more banal than that. We've finally arrived to dismantle the master's house using the master's tools, but he doesn't live there anymore. He's buying up water rights and spearheading land grabs elsewhere. He hopes we'll tear his house down because it's insured for more than he could get from selling the place. His nephew, who's into social justice and deep ecology, is using the house now, holding a frat party splash uh, slash spiritual retreat there. And he invites us all in for vodka shots and ayahuasca. No, these new masters have no home, no country. They are super wealthy refugees from the great nations they've gutted and rendered irrelevant, building leaky life rafts from decentralized autonomous organizations, making a crossing to digital realms without Westphalian borders, a bid in a bid to keep all their shit while the world floods and boils. Anyway, it, it goes on. But basically, yeah, that that's my, that's my rant. And these are the things that are concerning me. Um, I was kind of, what's the opposite of inspired? Anyway, that I was that by um, COP26. And just the, um, you know, how the basically the theme of COP26, it should have been a subtitle was, you know, centering native voices. Um, well, we essentially just go, yeah, we, we're prepared to do uh, anything as long as it's only pricing carbon. Um, anyway, let's just open things up. Um, old story, new story, decolonization, um, moving right through with the little people running alongside and plenty of folklore. Jump in, beautiful people. Who's first? Given there's a silence at the risk of being told off in the chat again, all right, there, we, we did a fascinating project for the US government on the collapse of empires. And we looked at the Chinese, the Roman, the English, the American empire. Yeah. And we had to exclude the Chinese because they don't conquer. They let the barbarians conquer them, then they make them Chinese. And that's what they've been doing with capitalism. So if you look at the Chinese expansion strategy, it's to own natural resources for their internal purposes. They're not trying to impose their ideology. And I would argue one of the reasons China didn't turn much time on Glasgow is they can't be bothered. They've already got their own strategy on global warming. It's probably more effective than anything in the West anyway, because they're planning long term. And why would they bother playing those sort of games, right? Whereas the, uh, the American and English empires collapse at the point where it's quite fascinating where they suddenly realize people don't want to be Roman or don't want to be English or don't want to be American because they've built on the assumption that everybody wants to be like them. And you know, with the Indian mutiny, destroyed that for the English, they couldn't sustain it thereafter. And I think at the moment, you've now got the sort of, and I think you're completely right, I love that passage. Fundamentally, you've now got six or seven high net worth individuals who basically run the world. And the danger is, you know, and this is one of the big nasty scenarios, they might decide to take um, geoengineering into their own hands. And they're all techno they're all techno fetishists. They believe the solution to the world and everything is rests in, as you said, in digital technology. So I think that's a problem. We've we've lost we've lost an empire to challenge. There's nobody to rebel against. Yeah. And therefore, there's no means of gaining governance back because there isn't anything to fight against. Uwa, uh, Melanie, Beth, jump in there. Well, I was reading about um, 
the concept of you know social media and and this this idea of you know we all a lot of us grew up with with an enemy um, through the through the nuclear threat and before that the the world wars the the Cuban Missile Crisis I mean and and there was there was always sort of something that that motivated us in terms of um, trying to, to to do the right thing and 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 take on you know the the evil somewhere and this author i was reading um sociologist i think he's from europe he he talked about the the evil on the keyboard like how it's dispersed now yeah. and so we can be so cruel um to each other we can you know the trolls and and the things and it's affecting you know mental health and it's doing all of these things and so um and so there you can kind of think of an enemy but you know the the nation state enemy and now we have the corporate the corporate gods who are um manipulating us in in ways that even when we become aware of it you kind of go yeah i guess you know i'm contributing so when you become aware of self and system and the role that you're playing your carbon footprint for example even in the north uh here the 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 privilege that we have um that all of that becomes uh something that it's, it's very difficult to cope with i mean it adds to the anxiety and i'm just thinking about the the mental health and the anxiety levels of folks to sort of say okay well then what do i do about um the billionaires that are getting in spaceships and going and sort of you know are going up and touristing in, in space and the colonization of of space and I've been on a, a couple of webinars listening to people talk about that, uh, the colonization of space and and the idea of um, we've destroyed our Earth Mother. And so now we're going to go find somewhere else that we can destroy. And I think, you know, in that passage, I mean, I love this this idea of the bespoke and and the decolonization in the in that sense, the D um, was always the binary of, you know, reacting to something and that binary you felt like you got somewhere when you when you were getting buy-in you know and then the buy-in was oh okay so i'm a for example a white person and i'm privileged and i'm wealthy and so but that in itself is not the end point you know now what do we do with that and i think that's really um a key kind of intervention point in in the systems is how we relate to each other with a, a certain maturity i guess and that's part of that seventh fire prophecy and that that involves the the spirit and i and i think you know when when the elders talk about spirituality and spirit for example so i i um am moving home and i'm leaving something called turtle island institute it's going to continue in the world but what one of the elders had said to me was but you have to make sure that you tell the turtle spirit who's been helping you which is uh, I have a pawagan, a pipe, um, but for my work, I also have a turtle rattle, a shaker. And the turtle spirit gifted those to me through ceremonies. Through six years of building that institute, I was in ceremony. And she said to me, um, Ella Skeed from Wajushkinagam, she said, you need to make sure that the spirit knows, the turtle spirit knows that you're not giving anything away. You're not giving away your teaching lodge. And so for me, the teaching lodge is with me it's sort of within me and she said and your home is not just home up north it's in that shijiguan it's in that rattle and that's you know um and maybe i'll just share quickly what <clears throat> what she said one time we were watching a, uh, a video that we had filmed and the video featured that rattle that that shijiguan but it also featured a nishinaabe spirit horse and so as a as a uh a, you know a decision in the editing suite uh, the director had put a picture of the horse because it was a beautiful shot to open the horse walking through a forest. And we all watched it, a group of us, and I thought, oh, that's a beautiful, you know, five minute uh, kind of film. And, and then Eleanor watched it and she comes, you know, from a place of spirit. And she said, hmm, out of respect, maybe you should show the rattle first and then the, the horse because the horse medicine is not the, the main medicine it's the turtle medicine it's the miganak shishikwan that that you are sh showcasing in that piece and so to me that's that's when we think about these things when we think about you know 
um, this whole idea of decolonization, when it comes from a place of spirit, what does it mean? Because it's very different than an intellectual. Um, you know, it comes from a place of both, I think, heart and mind. And that's what that rattle is, that teaching. And I won't get into it here because it'll, it'll take a long time, but there's an Abzuken, a legend uh, of that rattle. And I'll just say when we were um, told in a sweat lodge ceremony to make that rattle, it was to be um, red on the left and white on the right because the left and the red represented heart and the white represented mind. And it was to help me understand that spirit does come through the heart and the mind. Because I had dismissed the mind. I had dismissed intellectualism as, as not a gift, you know? And I didn't realize that, that the spirits talk both through my heart, but also through my mind. And so when I write a paper, uh, that spiritual work, even though we spend a lot of time decolonizing that writing, and saying, um, this is, I'm going to write, but this is a decolonized version of what I'm writing. And I'm writing a dissertation right now. That's, that's what I'm doing. And then part of me is also just saying, you know what, I am uh, writing from a place of spirit. And so whatever I write is going to be my story because it's my birthright to, to write that story, to, to teach um, from my spiritual perspective, what I have to offer into the world. Although I have seen you write in like one paper that's two in a two row album which is pretty damn cool structurally <laughs> and i i think that's the key is um you know with decolonization if you're not somehow coming into the structure of things then it's um it's useless it's just window dressing it's just poetry it just make you feel better um but it's not really doing anything at all um huh? Beth, what are your thoughts? For me to, to reflect on, on Tyson's provocation, um, I think that the, the saying that, that kind of captures it the best is the idea of selling security for free, oh, sorry, sowing the seeds of insecurity for free in order to be able to sell security. Um, and you know, this, this is something that we, you know, it, it is a privilege in our sense in that we have experienced this at least once before. Um, so that you know we, we do have some idea as to to what to expect and 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 some of the the, the kind of carried forward knowledge from that um, where it's not been completely destroyed or or we've you know completely sided with the oppressor um, and so actually thinking about how some of that that pre-colonial um, or pre-colonized knowledge still does exist in in its small pockets um, and how that can be um, not shared in the commodifying it sense, um, but certainly drawn upon and, and, and reinvigorated um, in, in a more modern sense. Um, and for me, the, the spiritual aspect of that is, is again really, really prevalent there in that, that people devalue, um, you know, the, the invisible or irrational um, forms of knowledge. Um, and I think to, to, to decolonize, you know, it depends upon what, what level of privilege you're giving that, that knowledge as opposed to um, stuff that fits the, the, the kind of current mold or the, the colonialist mold. Um, well, it's, so. it's, it's a bit like, you know, people will focus on all the entities, you know, of LORE law, of your folklore, you know, and all the lovely characters you know, that are populating that folklore. Um, they'll focus on everything but the landscape, everything but the topography, you know, of the place. So if you have this sort of uh, really, you know, uh, Western imperial kind of cosmology um, that you're using to try and view, you know, you're trying to populate that with all these exotic bits and pieces you find, then nothing quite works. It's that, that lovely phrase that I keep hearing in these circles with people who are doing all the, you know, um, first principles thinking and, you know, all the new atheists and all these mm, amazing minds that are occupying the complexity space. I keep hearing this phrase, turtles all the way down. You guys heard that a fair bit? And it brings it back to this turtle uh, magic here, um, Malini. Yeah, that, that's that idea that, you know, somebody, a woman who believed that the 
the world rested on a turtle's back and somebody asked her, well, what's, what's the turtle standing on? And she thought about it and said, well, it's turtles all the way down. And, you know, so they refer to that as, you know, whenever there's that kind of logic going on, they'll, they'll say turtles all the way down, you know, um, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's what they all would also call a, a thought terminating cliche, that one. Because if your cosmology, if that's the way you're conceptualizing space <laughs> as something that must be, it's infinite, but at the same time must be filled, otherwise nothing may be tethered, nothing may be located, nothing may be, you know, unless it is hitched in some way to the center and that somehow the center, um, which is the human, which is the world, which is, you know, uh, the city or whatever else. The center is the only thing that, that is hitched. I, um, anyway, that's that's just, yeah, that, that doesn't work with, so anybody who's interested in finding out more about the rattle and about the turtle business and about Mulaney and I with our stories uh, overlapping with those things, um, there, there is like a three hour uh, yarn that we had uh, that's up on my podcast, the other others uh, from way back. Um, I think it's called... Um, indigenous knowledge systems thinking or something um and we did talk a lot about that you know but for me that hexagonal uh business of spirit that that sort of strongest shape you know in existence and most efficient shape for fitting everything together and and you know keeping everything in the right place that hexagonal kind of uh pattern law dreaming uh that comes out of honeybee that comes out of you know turtle that that is a fractal pattern of spirit and relation and creation that just yeah that is everything and that goes every everywhere as far as everything goes so yes it's turtles all the way down my brothers it's turtles all the way down and all the way up and all the way everywhere um <laughs> yeah that's that's how i feel about that um but yeah you can't just decolonize you know, one small patch of space that that is anchored to this weird imperial cosmology, you know, just by populating it with a few gremlins and fairies from our cultures, you know, those those fairies and gremlins exist in a landscape, in a spirit, in a, a topography of spirit that is um, that is patterned uh, differently. And you have to have the ground first before you can put the figure, you know, um, in our way and in our logic, you know, so that's the way that has to go. Hey, Beth, I felt like you were, you were, um, you actually had a B, a part B to what, where you were going there and that you yeah, just finished A. Lost, whatever that one was. <laughs> oh man, I'm sorry. I saw you looking down, so I thought you had a note. So no, I, I was reading be... the chat. God damn. Hey, um, can you keep, keep you, keep us across the chat? Because I, I actually can't read it because as you know, I lost my glasses yesterday, so I can't read anything that's going on in the chat. If anybody wants to swear me, now's the time because I can't even see it. You've escaped it so far, Tyson. Terry Pratchett, who's a fantasy author, actually is relevant there because he satirized the turtles all the way down with the idea that the world is a disc on the back of four elephants standing on the back of a turtle. And I mean, if you go into Pratchett, I've had the privilege of knowing him through Jack Cohen his final heroine, Tiffany, it's worth people reading the Tiffany books because Tiffany is a shepherdess who is linked in with her land and with her people. Yeah, and she's actually his inheritor, his final book about his death, where he's basically passing on to Tiffany. But that's actually worth looking at. There are, there are things within modern literature which pull back on some of these things. There's also an interest, in fact, one of the things the Chinese are doing, which I think we should copy in the West, is they're limiting access to the internet for young people. They're basically saying, you, you've got to spend some time in the outdoors and doing things. And you know, I mean, the, the libertarians in the States who are driven by the needs of the big tech companies are saying this is an appalling infringement on liberty. It seems to me like an appalling infringement on liberty to prevent young people spending time with other people and with the land in terms of the way it works. Yeah? I was, I was hunting down a poem, so I wasn't just reading for the sake of it. There's, this is, um, if you don't know, M.R.S. Thomas is an Anglo-Welsh poet. He's probably one of the greatest of modern poets. And I won't read it because I couldn't do it justice, but it's worth looking up his poem, Reservoirs. 
because in, in the Welsh tradition, you know, packs of parliament were taken to destroy whole valleys with their communities to drown them, to provide water to the big cities in Liverpool and Birmingham. Yeah. And I say, just to take sort of one phrase out of that, you know, just trying to think, you know, uh, reservoirs, they are the subconscious of a people troubled far down with gravestones, chapels, villages, even the serenity of their expression revolts me at suppose. And I, I love that because it's that the reservoir has now become a place of pilgrimage and beauty and, and water sports. But underneath it is a whole culture, yeah, which is actually being drowned and destroyed. And I, I think that's what we're also seeing with the internet and jumping around a little bit, is people are creating this veneer across human reality, which actually prevents us connecting you know, with the land, with people, with other people. But it looks serene, right? And I, 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 for me, that's deeply problematic. False serenity. Mm. Um, yeah, Beth, I was I was actually really keen to to hear um, more too on the and your thoughts of the uh, decolonization two point uh, pluses and minuses, uh, you know, the centering native voices, etc. Like I know you feel torn around that because there's that yes, it's good. Like we're finally we we can speak. Um, you know, but can we? Because if you say the wrong thing at COP26, they'll uh, they'll take away your uh, your invitation for the following year. By the way, which did happen to to Na a lot of quite a few native peoples there who actually wanted to talk about it, something real, <laughs> rather than yeah, you know this idea that you know eighty percent, right? Eighty percent of the remaining biodiversity on the planet right, is on lands managed by indigenous people. So, you know, one of the best thing we can do is send a native uh, voices. If we do that, we're protecting the biodiversity, which is uh, stopping climate change. So that's how they kind of jujitsu their way around, like going, hey, we're sequestering carbon by centering these voices, you know. Um, but I, I was interviewed for that. And I started talking about the reality of these lands that apparently are under our control. Because <laughs> I keep hearing all this stuff like, oh yeah, two thirds of Australia is, you know, under native title <laughs> kind of thing. And is, you know, managed by indigenous people. <laughs> so I was talking about the realities of that on the ground that there's almost no exclusive native title. And there's almost nowhere that's just looked after by us in our old way. You know, so this rubbish about 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity being managed by us, that's just not true. Um, yeah, it, it would be great if you could let us do that. That would be awesome. But it's not true. Anyway, I started saying that. And you know, when they grab their ear like that, and you know, someone's shouting from another room in their ear hole through their earpiece, you know, that, that happened and that, that got shut down real quick. And I imagine there was a fair bit of that at COP um, from the reports that I've heard cop why would they go anyway beth what are your thoughts on decolonization 2.0 on the window dressing on the green washing on the Mulaney red washing everything going on in the world i think that from, from particularly from a welsh kind of policy and cultural point of view right now um that, that to me it seems like an almost a self-imposed sense of um, commodification um, that people are being empowered and under the guise of um, economic development, um, sustainable economic development, um, to conform to non, I would say certainly kind of non traditional um, exploitation of land and, and, and um, natural resources, um, but on the basis of that's just better than coal mining. Um, so it, because it's better than what we've had, it's, it's somehow good, um, but not necessarily something that, that you know, it, anything's better than, than it's, as you've mentioned earlier, and I, I'm getting very, very tired because it's getting quite late here. So the, 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 the depth of my intellectual output might be a bit limited right now. Um, 
but yeah, th this idea of a set change. That, so whatever, you, so long as whatever you're doing now is better than what was there before, then it's, it's given the gold star, um, and is probably by no means you know as, as good as it could be, um, or as good as it, it possibly has been you know at, at different points in time. Um, you know, so it it might be better than the immediate past, um, but you know what what preceded that, um, and are, are there things that could be um, kind of drawn upon or, or reinvigorated from there um, with the, this, this idea of, you know, ha without being fully past dependent, um, you know, just because, you know, a point in history things changed doesn't mean that we still don't have access to the knowledge that preceded that or the ways of doing things that preceded that. Um, so, you know, questioning some of that linearity of time in that sense. Mm. Yeah. Um... It was Douglas Roscoff, he was telling me, um, it, he has this really great phrase for that, and he calls it um, uh, retrieving forward. Um, so it's not about this idea of that you're returning to this great and glorious past, because that's always folly. And you look at all the worst movements in history, there were people who were trying to return to some kind of golden age. But he's, he talks about, yeah, retrieving forward um, these things as a, a way of... of uniting unifying past and future you know into a, um, a a kind of a different model of time um that works a bit better than that and i could see that 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 structure yeah in what you were just saying that you know that controlling of the past through uh seizing the narrative and letting everybody know how awful the past was so they can appreciate the present you know that's oh look at mining was awful wasn't it this is heaps better than mining you know, and then it's contracts to control the future. And so, of course, we're told that we're getting this um, self-determination all the time. But it's not self-determination. It's self-administration. Mm. You know, like you do in death camps with prisoners. You know, you, you get other prisoners to do the head count, you know, at the start of the day and the end of the day while people are dropping like flies. You get them to uh, do all the worst parts of the administration. And I find that with all this self-determination, um, this bogus self-determination that we supposedly have, that it's more self-administration than anything. And it is about uh, controlling that narrative of the past um, and seizing control of the present, you know, by then also locking people into contracts about the future. Um, yeah, Mulaney and Dave, can we, can we try and bundle up this time? Have you got a time bundle for us, Mulaney? Somehow. I'll go first, then you can finish up, Milani, because we're coming to the end, getting towards the end anyway. I, th I think um, there was a, a big subject which came up in a in a webinar that myself and Nora Bateson did, um, which was last week, which was absolutely fascinating. But one of the things we were looking at, and which is a major area of my work at the moment is how do you break path dependency? Um, it's, it's one of the key complexity concepts, the concept that what's happened in the past determines what will happen in the future. And the trouble is the number of bifurcations available to us is going down. So one of the big things I'm interested in is how, I mean, this is taking this concept of entanglement. How, and I don't wanna take time in a linear sense here, I want to take time in the sense of meaning. How do we entangle people's timelines so that they can see different micro connections and effectively jump out of path dependencies? And I think that's actually where we need to go with narrative. Somebody was asking in the line about how do we create a new narrative? If you ask the question that way, you're actually playing into the hands of power because you will never create a new narrative. You have to nurture micro narratives. And they have to be the micro narratives of empathy with other people and with the land. And that's what we need to start to do. And it's only once we do that, that things like COP will work. Because until the dispositional state is such that people will accept sacrifice, no politician will make the sacrifices that we need. So for me, this concept of entanglement around points of coherence, breaking path dependency, is one of the big things we've got to work on, and it's going to be micro-level work, not macro-level work. That was beautiful. Yeah, that was. By the way, that hit the spot. Nora helped enormously with that. It's a lot of fun to. Well, you know that, Nora. 
nor is just fun to talk with. When I first heard about path dependent disease, it was the story of, you know, the recipe where you, you cut part of the roast off and, and put it in the oven. And then someone, you know, three generations ahead says, why don't we cut part of the roast off? Well, because great, great grandma had a really small stove and a very small pot. And so she always had to cut part of the roast off. And, and then we continue to do that. And to me, that brings up the idea of storytelling and, you know, like those micro narratives. And <clears throat> I remember with some Haida elders, we had been talking about food sovereignty and, you know, our foods, um, which are a big part of our culture, have been drowned, you know, our wild rice, for example, you know, they've been um, destroyed. And so getting access to these foods, someone had said, well, maybe we should write a, a recipe book, you know, a recipe. And in the Haida people are on the coast and these elders said, you know, when the table, is, uh, when the tide is out, the table is set is one of their sayings and they had an ancestor plate and we did this beautiful ceremony. But when when someone brought up the idea of, of doing a recipe book, they said, well, that doesn't, that's kind of a, a formulaic, I guess, is not the word they use, but I think mm. that's what they were trying to say. It doesn't really teach you <clears throat> to be on the land, to understand how to be in relationship with those beings, with that food. And I, and I think about the, the stories and you know, the narratives when I mentioned that movie, who's got the power to, to shift that, but it's also those, those conversations that we have with each other and <clears throat> telling cultural stories or, you know, I'm gonna, cause we don't have a lot of time left, but I'll just share a really short version of the story that I've uh, shared many times with people. I was offered a gift when I was on the uh, East coast of Canada and it included a little Nishomas, a stone, a rock, you know, like you would see a pebble at the beach and some tobacco. And I went home to our, our sweat lodge uh, with my Auntie Lynn skied and I gifted her that tobacco because this group on the East Coast had a question. And when we were in the ceremony, she came out and she said, oh, that little rock, that Manitou, that spirit wants to go home. He's from the other coast. He's from the West Coast mm -hmm. of Canada, which is 2000, whatever, 2500 miles long. And and, he, and she said, he's wearing a volcano hat, this little Manitou, the spirit. And I thought, oh, volcano hat. And, and she's blind, my auntie. And so I thought about it and I realized that's the West Coast people and their cedar hats that look like this. And I said, he's, he must have a cedar hat on. And she gave the stone back to me, this little Manitou, this little person. And it was a little, uh, a, 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 you know, a little man. And she said, he wants you to take him home. And I was going to the West Coast uh, about a month later, and I had this little being with me. And I asked some elders in Sartlip First Nation, I said, can you meet me tomorrow? Um, I have something to ask you. And the next morning, uh, they called me in my room very early. And, and Talactin, he said to me, are you asking us for a ceremony? And I said, yes, I am. Because I woke up singing a new song. And I said, well, I have a little manadu a little Manitou here and he's from here and he's coming home. We'll pick you up. We have to start our preparations before the sun comes up. And so they picked me up and we went out to the, to the water, to the ocean and they put medicines on me in their culture and they sang songs and we had picked up a big cedar bough and we put it on the water. And then we put that little Manitou there and he went into the water and the elder came back and she said to me, look, he gave you his hat and she held up a little seashell that was this shaped. And I still have that, this little hat. And then we walked up to the beach and there were four eagles circling above. And we were all crying because it was so moving because she said his ancestors came here to welcome him home. And it was so moving and I, I grieved. I had such beautiful company um, with this little Manadu and then I brought him home. And I, and I share that story because with so many people, because with the disenchantment and the irrational, you know, nature of um, the enlightenment coming out of all of that scientific, um, chronically overdeveloped reason, my uncle Ben has called it, we, people are ashamed of those relationships. And I think those are the, the micro relationships each individual needs to have with the landscape, with the spirit beings, with the language. Um, that that is how we're going to get to some collective 
you know, resonance, if we want to call it decolonization, but really it's a, it's a, it's a reconnection to each other and to the mm. world and all our relatives. Yeah. And did a in the book. Mm. So, Collective connective awesome. resonance. I think, yeah, is a really good takeaway. And there's a, probably a really you know, good way to rethink what, um, what decolonization may be. Um, yeah. The, I, I, I would love to see things just arise organically that don't need to have a name. I always say that once you give it a name, it's finished, you know. Um, and I like the idea when I, when I hear about the relations that, that Dave is talking about and, and how this emergence occurs. You know, it's like that thing that can't be measured. It's that leap that goes across from the tangible world of cells and neurons and brain chemistry to consciousness. So, you know, Western science is happy to say that consciousness is simply something arising from your biology and your chemistry, you know, but they're not quite sure how it makes that leap across from one world to the other. And, you know, in our cosmologies, there's several, you know, ways of describing that. It's that, you know, those worlds aren't as separate as you think uh, in one way. I mean, then in the other way, um, a lot of the metaphors we use for that are around spirit and magic. And I think when Dave talks about building those new narratives, that they don't, you can't have them be built, that they do have to arise. But you know what, there's, um, there are some laws of attraction going on there. Um, because the most attractive narratives and the ones that tend to aggregate into the big stories and the most successful memes and narratives, um, these are the ones that include spirit, that include magic. And it's probably the reason for the success, uh, the overwhelming success of the extremely unpopular um, ultra-right neoconservative ideologies on the planet that almost nobody agrees with. <laughs> But these are doing very, very well. It's because they have good story. And it's because their story includes spirit. Their story includes magic. And nobody else's does. So, um, you know, they, they tend to kill a lot of followers. Uh, even in the Aboriginal community right now, we have, um, we have a lot of QAnon and um, sovereign citizen uh, kind of movements coming up in the in the Aboriginal community in Australia, and I know in the Maori community, um, these are very attractive narratives. And they're attractive because they have mar magic, they have spirit. Um, and Dave, you can see my daughter, but you can hear her banging on the door here. She's coming back for that, uh, that selkie. She's coming back for that mermaid again, bros. See, she's calling out for mermaid banging on the door. <laughs> that was from a previous webinar. Um, all right. The thing that religion did is, I mean, if you go back before the religious wars, so you go back, say, before the Reformation in Europe, priests were mediators, not enforcers of doctrine, because religion was just part of the way that people lived their lives. And then it became an ideological matter. And I think, and I mentioned, I can't remember the name of the Italian philosopher, he basically railed against the Enlightenment, because he said, you've got all these wonderful discoveries, but you're throwing out everything else. Yeah, it, 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 it's why I never liked sociology, because they thought they could replace philosophy with Newtonian physics, yeah, for people. And that sort of quasi-determinism, I think, is a real problem. And I think, I mean, Braden Friesgrass, Sweetgrass, we mentioned a few times, that the concept of braiding, intertwining, entanglement. And I think we've got to find ways to disconnect from time-based dependency on change. And I'm still not quite sure what I mean by that or what's needed, but We've got to find ways to do that, right? And it's not a meditative thing. It's not a, it's not a sort of faux Buddhist thing. I think it's about engagement. It's about going and doing things together in small ways. Um, and I think we've lost that capacity to walk together and talk. Is All we want to do now is talk to a screen. And the simpler narratives of walking and talking, we need to rediscover. Final words on phase shift, decolonization 3.0, etc. cetera, um, uh, from, the, from the ladies to close.
Come on, Beth, you introduced it and you, you have deep expertise in this, right? I've heard you be quite profound, so please trot it out, right? <laughs> it's half past 10 at night here and I've been up since six, so um, the, uh, the creative juices aren't quite flowing. Oh, half past 10, that must be terrible. What you, got? <laughs> you don't even have children, do you? You have babies, no. you don't even know. Oh, it's half past 10. <laughs> there's a new, That's there's when a you new start book. work. That's when you start new your work. Book, you guys, and I'm going to send it to you. It's how to teach your dog North Welsh. <laughs> I feel you need it. Right? I'm going to get that sent to you. It came out this week. It's a brilliant book. I, I prefer my bad one. It's funnier. <laughs> okay, Beth. Beth. Come on, rouse yourself. Girl, it's only 10.30. You're starting work. Yeah, we're, we're really scraping the butt with a barrel here. Um, final final points on decolonization for me. Um, I, I'm going to defer back to defer pardon? Cognitive sovereignty. Build on that. Go on. No, because I, that, I, that's I, linked I, to it. Yeah, so the Dave kind of prompted for, for cognitive sovereignty and this, you know, people's right to, to self-determine their own ways of making sense of the world. Um, and and to, as opposed to not default to, you know, societal expectations on, on privileging um, certain narratives or, or ways of knowing. But again, I think I, I want to reflect back to the, the previous yarn on, on what we ended with here and this idea of, of neighborliness um you know that's not to say that ultimately the the you know the kind of hegemon is is wrong within its own own confines um but you know the the spilling out into to other people's back gardens is the you know the if you want to you know keep your garden the way you keep yours and, and you know at least respect our choice to keep ours the way we do um, even if we don't choose to mow the lawn in that sense. Um, that comes back to that, that uh, thing you wrote uh, in a previous one about uh, good and bad neighbours. Yeah. That, that poem you read to us. Said, that's, that's the thing that sticks out in my mind more than anything else <laughs> in all of these so far, which have been amazing. Um, Mulaney, um, as, you, as you flee um, back to your homelands, um, <laughs> as you like uh, race away from the Turtle Island Institute and head back to your homelands, parting, parting words uh, from amidst all your boxes as you're packed. Mm -hmm. From amidst all of the boxes. I think um, I will just share what, uh, you know, an elder shared with me about home. And, uh, you know, on a webinar earlier this week with a group of storytellers, everybody was asked to talk about home and it was such a, divisive conversation for the people living in the diaspora and the you know those who couldn't go home and and what the elder had said to me about that shishiva and that rattle is she said that's that's your home and so so i am home here but but heading home to the to the homelands is uh it's special for me because in 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 this country and i think it might be the same in australia to get educated you have to go to the sea and then you get you know, offered a good job and, and, and to teach at a university. And so I've been exploring decolonization from the perspective of who's going to let me go home, but still mm. work with me. And, mm. and I think that's been really uh, a part of me. Maybe that's what I'll, I'll share is that I am heading home. And uh, it's it's been tough to get back there um, mm. for all kinds of reasons. And we call it the brain drain, you know, our young people when they get educated. Mm. And so um, I'm really thrilled to be doing that and so happy to be part of this yarn. And, mm. uh, and I'll leave you with uh, that, uh, the rattle, the shishiguan, you know, there's 13 moons on the turtle's back and there's 13 manitou, there's 13 stones that are in, inside that rattle. And when you shake it side to side, it's healing. And I think, you know, healing self and systems uh, is, that's how, how we're gonna get to where we're trying mm. to go. And I think there's a tremendous amount of healing that needs to happen um mm. and all of these helpers that's who we need to ask you know it's not only the human beings uh there's so many other helpers that uh are on this journey with us so yeah, we're you. happy to so we're happy to do the work but let us go home mm. that maybe that's the message to the empire from this last webinar eh? 
<laughs> so just go home. We'll do a bit of work for you. No worries. Yeah, it's a good, good compromise. Yeah. It's lovely to talk to you again. And that's um that's a wrap. Beautiful people. I believe it's it's half past. Is that our time? Our time done? <laughs>